We're joined now by California Representative Ro Khanna. Congressman, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Yes, it's our pleasure, and we have a lot we want to talk about with you today. Um, first, we want to get your reaction. House Republicans obviously moving forward with this impeachment inquiry against President Biden. Here's Speaker McCarthy's announcement yesterday. These are allegations of abuse of power, obstruction, and corruption. And they warrant further investigation by the House of Representatives. That's why today I am directing our House committee to open a formal impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. This logical next step will give our committees the full power to gather all the facts and answers for the American public. That's exactly Representative, your response. Well, I thought Senator Fetterman had the best response and that, that this is silly. It's silly season in Washington. Uh, McCarthy doesn't even have the votes in his own caucus to do this. Uh, it's not going anywhere in the Senate. Uh, and it's just political gamesmanship to try to put a black eye on the president heading into 2024. Are you concerned it will be effective, even if it is silly, that there is a percentage of the American population, including the liberal media, which is increasingly covering this issue, who at very least see this as a kind of corruption, even if it's soft corruption, and maybe makes them think that the kinds of allegations that have been uh, that Donald Trump has been charged with are less a big a deal because everybody basically in, in the so-called swamp is tarnished. No, I don't think it'll be effective because the Republicans don't even have the votes in their own caucus. Uh, we, Donald Trump, remember, was impeached twice. And even the impeachment inquiry that the speaker brought the first time, two weeks later, there was a vote ratifying that inquiry uh, by the House of Representatives. Here, you don't have the votes. And that shows that the Republicans themselves know that this is just a totally politically motivated investigation for the reasons you said. I mean, Trump is wants this because he's trying so desperately, twice impeached, four times indicted, to try to muddy the waters and uh, get something to stick to President Biden. He's been trying that. That was one of the reasons he was impeached the first time. He's been looking for dirt, to manufacture dirt from the, the beginning, and uh, it's not going to work. You know, are you worried, though, about, you know, the polls showing President Biden's um, approval ratings that uh, many people, a uh, you know, majority, I think, even in the Democratic Party, would prefer another candidate? Um, polls showing him running about even with Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, actually, if she was somehow to be the nominee up, you know, above uh, President uh, Biden. Is, is he in a weaker um, position in terms of his reelection than one would hope for in your party? Look, if we looked at polls this early out, uh, we would have had uh, President Gary Hart, uh, probably not had Ronald Reagan's reelection. We would have had uh, President Michael Dukakis. We wouldn't have had George Herbert Walker Bush. I think Dukakis was up 17 points at one point of four or five months before the election. So I just don't pay that much attention to polls this far out of an election. Historically, they haven't mattered. What does matter is the president's record. And what is going to matter is the economy. And we've got to continue to work hard to bring gas prices down, food prices down, and to create good paying new jobs. Well, that's part of the issue as well. I think people have been pointing to the consequences of the pandemic era programs ending. The administration once bragged about having child poverty. Now we're seeing kind of record levels of the same. Uh, there has been a lot of disapp disappointment around the student debt issue, as I'm sure you know. Uh, many of us got emails in our inbox over the last week or so announcing that uh, we were going to have to start repayments uh, as of next month. In the middle of an election year, after three years of having the loans on a moratorium, a moratorium that was put there by Donald Trump while Donald Trump was in office. Uh, do you think that Democrats can make a good case that the economy is doing well and that they should feel better about their economic status today than they did three or four years ago? But Brianna, I do. I mean, we got the infrastructure bill passed. If you go around the country, there are a lot of good paying jobs. We're bringing manufacturing back, semiconductor manufacturing, new electric vehicle, battery manufacturing. We're creating a lot of union jobs. Unions have never been stronger. The president's NLRB has said that if you have unfair labor practices, this is Jennifer Abruzzo in C the CMEX decision, then unions will automatically be recognized. So a lot of good has happened. But 
Look, I disagree on the student loans. I mean, it was the Supreme Court uh, that struck that down. And I believe I pushed the president to say, at least let's stop the interest accrual. As someone who took out $100,000 of loans, I was fortunate. I paid them back. But there were years in my 20s when I was making payments and the the the, the number kept piling up because of uh, interest. And so we have to at least stop that interest accrual. Uh, and I, I do hear people uh, struggling because of the student loan issue. Well, Representative Khan, I do have to push back on two things. One, the loans have started again because Joe Biden chose to negotiate the end of the moratorium as part of the last debt ceiling negotiations. That was a choice by Joe Biden that cannot be attributed to the Supreme Court. If he plans to challenge the Supreme Court decision, as he is doing, he could say, let's continue the moratorium so that people don't have to pay sums that ultimately are going to be canceled when I am successful. And two, many student loan experts, all of the student loan experts that I've spoken to, and I think I've talked talk to you about this on my own podcast as well, so that Joe Biden could have made the choice to cancel all student debt via, via executive order using the same authority that Trump used to start the moratorium in the first place. But because he chose to means test it, he gave people this hook to go ahead and challenge it in court. So for many voters, they understand that this was a choice, a series of choices that the Biden administration made that have put them in the situation of starting repayment uh, next month. So what do you say to those 44 million voters who might be feeling betrayed by Joe Biden in this in this instance? Well, look, the president used the HEROES Act, uh, and he can still use the Higher Education Act. So even though he made that deal with uh, McCarthy, which I disagreed with, I voted against it, as you remember, uh, he still now is pursuing the Higher Education Act to try to suspend uh, the, the repayments on the loans. And I believe under the Higher Education Act, he will have the authority. And I, I do think the administration should, when they have the authority, uh, zero out the loans that up to the 20,000 that they've said, uh, so that uh, people, are, if they're going to court, are going into court to sue students as opposed to having no relief. Would I have been more aggressive than the president? I would have. But the reality is that the president has done uh, a lot. I mean, he has uh, invoked the authority. He's fought this in court. He's now invoking another authority. And the real blame of this is on the Supreme Court and on the Republican side, where they made zero effort. So I and some progressives want to make an effort of a 10. President Biden probably was at a seven. And then you've got a Supreme Court and Republicans at a zero. The blame doesn't go from someone who's at a seven. The blame goes to people who are at a zero. But, Ro Khanna, uh, isn't it the case that but for him choosing to negotiate, of all things, the end of the moratorium, people would not have to start paying in the middle of an election year their student loan payments back on October 1st? That was a choice that was purely within Joe Biden's purview, no? No, because he negotiated saying that he wouldn't invoke the... HEROES Act is now invoking a different authority. He's invoking uh, the Higher Education Act. And if the Supreme Court was going to strike that's, down that's a different question, the use of the HEROES Act, then the, nego the negotiation wouldn't have mattered. It was moved after the Supreme Court. He would have had to have a different negotiation. The, 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 the negotiation only covers the HEROES Act. It doesn't cover the I, I'm Higher specifically Education. talking about the end of the moratorium, not this, the question about whether or not the cancellation itself it will ultimately be held up by the courts as a separate issue, but we can move on. But I want to be really clear, the moratorium is what people are concerned with, that Joe Biden made the choice to make them start repaying in the middle of an election year. But the moratorium is also under the HEROES Act. You could have the moratorium under the Higher Education Act. And we but, the moratorium wasn't, moratorium. but the moratorium wasn't what was challenged. That's a Trump-era policy that has been persisted for three years. That, true, yeah. true, but the moratorium, the, the deal of, uh, with McCarthy only applies to the HEROES Act you can still have a moratorium under the Higher Education Act or other uh, authorities. And we should be pushing for a moratorium on uh, interest accrual and student uh, repayment. And I believe we can do that even under the terms of the deal, because that only restricts the HEROES Act. Right. And obviously, there are many of us who think that um, people should repay exactly what they borrowed and that it would be a blunder to um, forgive people's debt obligations, actually. But that's my perspective, obviously not the progressive perspective. Representative, we wanted to um, ask you about a couple other things. You put forth a new five-point political reform platform, which includes things like banning candidates for federal office from receiving donations from lobbyists or political action committees of any kind, 18-year term limits for Supreme Court justices. Um, if Democrats win the House, will this legislation be a priority? Can you talk about it a little bit more? Uh, Nancy Pelosi, Je uh, Hakeem Jeffries, how do they feel about your legislation? Uh, fill us in. 
Well, I'll be putting it up, uh, hopefully, for a vote. And I want the Democrats to run on this, the president and members of Congress. We should have zero PAC money. We should not have leadership PACs. I don't take PAC money, never have, don't have a leadership PAC. We shouldn't have money from corporations or, or lobbyists. Um, members of Congress shouldn't be allowed to go become lobbyists ever. Uh, members of Congress shouldn't benefit personally through stock trading. Uh, members of Congress should have be term limited, as should Supreme Court justices, and we need an ethics vote for Supreme Court justices. The amazing thing is this common sense proposal has had so much support from uh, across the aisle, and I think it is a uh, opportunity for us to, to, to run on reform, to make reform. No one in the current political system is perfect. What voters are looking for is a bold agenda to fix the system. Hmm. Do you think Biden should embrace this, embrace this agenda? I do. I do. You know, I don't understand how a twice impeached, four times indicted former president is trying to run as the outsider. And I believe that the Democratic Party needs to run as the outsider. They're going to clean up a system that obviously isn't working for the ordinary, um, for ordinary Americans. Do I think most people who come to Congress have good intentions? I do. I actually do. But the point is that the system itself uh, is totally influenced by lobbyists, by special interest money, by members then ending up and going and becoming lobbyists. And the American people have no faith in that the system is actually looking out for them. These are the types of reforms that will say, we're trying to prioritize people uh, over special interests. You know, there are, there are challengers to Joe Biden, Marianne Williamson, RFK Jr., who are running on um, I, I think objectively more uh, progressive platforms are probably even are, are more uh, on board with some of the policies you yourself have put forward, in, including what you've just outlined. Um, and, and obviously there are so many in the Democratic Party have, that have said they would like a different um, nominee, which I, I know I've already asked you about. But um, is it is it simply because, you know, Biden is the incumbent, so you know, it would be very odd to not support the incumbent, even though there are more progressives in, in the race? You know, what is, the, what is the reason that one feels so strong about sticking with President Biden? Well, ideology isn't the only thing you look at when you vote for president of the United States. Experience matters. Can you do the job? Can you be the leader of the free world? Are you going to be able to rally our allies? Do you know how to lead the military? Are you going to be able to build coalitions in the House and the Senate to get things done? Uh, are you going to be able to spearhead legislation? So, uh, yes, there's some of the, his, his challengers who I may agree with on Medicare for all or free public college. But when I look uh, at who I think would be the best president overall, uh, I believe that's Joe Biden. You believe, you, you listed a, a number of things. It seems like me Medicare for all, having universal health care for millions of Americans and the w richest country in the history of the world, where we're currently paying twice as much for health care costs than any other peer nation. And we have something called medical bankruptcy uh, and also 68,000 people before the pandemic dying every year from a lack of health care is lower on the priority list than someone who can lead a military, a military which many Americans on both sides of the aisle feel like should be led less, a military budget that we think should be cut, many Americans think that should be cut significantly. Um, is it accurate to say that that's, that I've articulated no, your priorities? No, mischaracterization of my position. I was the only person on the Armed Services Committee, one out of 56, that people can look at who voted against the military budget going to a trillion dollars. And I have led on Medicare for All with Bernie Sanders. I'm going to be actually coming out with a bill with him on medical debt. But uh, it is giving people false hope to say that someone can just run on that and then get things done. What we need are people who are going to run on that and actually get co-sponsors, uh, push for a hearing, as Pramila Jayapala and I have, as Bernie Sanders would have. The reason I supported Bernie Sanders is that he was in the House and he was in the Senate. It wasn't just that he was taking these positions. He knew I had full confidence that Bernie Sanders had become president. Uh, that he would have been able to actually get these things done. And I don't believe you can just run for president without having any prior uh, experience in the federal system and be effective. I, I, I don't. Bernie Sanders had a lot of that experience. And what do you say to those who say, OK, well, I voted for Biden in 2020 because that was the pitch that was made. And in fact, what we've been hearing for the last three years is that to the extent that his agenda, core items of his agenda, promises that he made to Bernie Sanders of things he would fight for when Bernie Sanders dropped out very quickly in 2020 have not 
been actualized. For example, a $15 minimum wage, a policy so popular that uh, Trump's Florida in 2020 voted for it by 60, with 60 percent of voters supporting that particular policy. Um, the Build Back Better being bifurcated and uh, largely stripped in its uh, final incarnation. Uh, the Willow Project, um, the student debt uh, issue, which we've already discussed, which you attribute um, its failure to the Supreme Court. If the argument is that Joe Biden wasn't able to effectuate any of those kinds of policies, big ticket items, big promises, canceling all HBCU debt, canceling ten dollars to $20,000 of student debt for all Americans, a $15 minimum wage, can you really ar argue that Joe Biden is able to get things done? Well, look, I said that we should have fired the Senate parliamentarian. I wish we had gotten the uh, $15 wage, and I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post calling for that. I think the Willow Project was a terrible decision, $8 billion on public lands in Alaska for the largest oil drilling project on public lands. It was a gut punch to climate activists. So, uh, you know, I am not uh, saying that Joe Biden has been the perfect progressive president. I don't think he's been what Bernie Sanders would have been. But you have to look at the whole record. And he has gotten manufacturing jobs back. He has been one of the most pro-labor, pro-union presidents. He has Canceling stood up for reproductive rights. He has stood the railroad up strike, for though, Representative Khanna? It, the, the concern is that there are, he's a man of contradictions. He says he's the most pro-labor president. He has not made forceful statements supporting the in, workers in the impending UAW strike. And he crushed the rail strike earlier this year in a moment that people thought was one of the most anti-union actions that they've seen in their lifetimes. And, and with all due respect, I hear you distinguishing yourself from Biden, and I credit your record. But unless you are going to run for president, which I think some people would really love to see, at the end of the day, the question is whether or not the arguments that are made in Joe Biden's favor about his ability to get things done hold up three years after the Democratic Party has largely made the case that Joe Biden is not Joe Biden's fault, that he hasn't been able to fulfill many of his campaign promises. Well, I would say that Joe Biden has been more progressive than uh, I expected. Uh, he is standing in, on labor, I think he is genuinely, he stood with Starbucks workers, he stood with Amazon workers, he's standing with UAW workers. Now, I think we need to be 100% with UAW workers. I mean, the big three has a, have had $5 billion in stock buybacks. Where is that money going that they can't pay the workers more and they're getting tax subsidies? So obviously you're going to hear a progressive like me, like Bernie Sanders, uh, like uh, others in the progressive caucus, be want a bolder, more populist economic message and, uh, and, and stand clearer on climate and income inequality issues. That's why I supported Bernie Sanders. But in the context of the choice between uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden and in the context of his record, I would argue that it represents a shift of the Democratic Party more in the direction of Bernie Sanders uh, than not. And we should build on that progress. Representative Khanna, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it.